All right. <laughs> All right. My little talk tonight is on the joy of transformation. <laughs> I have to say that it's been such process. You know, when I, I met the Lord when I was young, I was nine years old. I was saved in vacation Bible school. I knew on Monday of that week that I needed him. But I was scared to walk down the aisle. But I just thought, well, you know. So the next day I sat and I longed. And I just, oh, it was like, anyway, day after day. So Friday came and I was like, Lord, please help me. And I don't know, he did. It's like something just got me up and walked with me down the aisle. It was so fun. And I was so excited. I went right home and told my little brother, you need to be saved. So... And I prayed with him. I don't know if that was really his testimony, but it certainly started mine. So I went, you know, all, all through the years, and I learned a lot about the Lord. I read the Word, and I learned about the Word. But I didn't know when I was young how, how does that affect you in your normal, everyday life. So I kind of had... You know, um, your friends at church, you, you know, you this, and then you got your friends at school, and then you got, you know, your relatives. And there were lots of boxes. And I, I didn't like that, but I didn't know how to make them one. And so I kind of went along and along and along, and then um, got teased in college because, you know, I was a Christian. I thought, well, good grief, I hate to be a hypocrite, you know. And so maybe it's just better if I just do my own thing. And, but the Lord, I love you, Lord. I love you. But, you know, I need to, I don't know how to follow you practically. And I don't want to do it wrong. So I'll just do my thing. Well, when I was 30, I found myself in hard circumstances when you do your own thing. So anyway, he began a process in me and I'm so grateful. And one of the first things that happened is I began to remember hearing, and I started hearing again, the names of God. And I thought, yeah, I know all about that. But I don't, I mean, is that real? Are those stories you hear about? So the other day, I just, I was laughing because I've just gotten to experience all, just tons of them, you know, and they're very real. And I got curious and I thought, Lord, who first called you that? When, you know, what were, what kind of circumstances were they in? So I just looked it right up. I just had the best time. And I just am here to tell you that, you know, I am who I am and I where I am. And a lot of you are too because of things and circumstances and relationships that just didn't work out. You know, it gets you off to a great start, you know, because then you get open <laughs> to learn something new. So I found out that we're in good company. So let me just tell you a little bit about this. Jehovah Roy, the God who sees. The God who sees. In Genesis 16, Abram, because he was Abram then, and Sarah had been promised a son. And they'd waited and waited for years and years and years until they're so old, she can't have any children. So, you know, but they, but they do believe God and they believe that it's for them. But it occurs to them one day, well, you know what? I have this maidservant and she's younger. You know, and the Lord gave me, gave her to me. So maybe you know what, Abram, why don't you take her? And we'll have a child through her. Great idea. They were like, you know, that has to be God or she wouldn't even be here. And so, lo and behold, Hagar, the slave, got pregnant. Well, from her perspective, I'm sure she had heard for years, I don't know how long she'd been with him, but long time all about this promise from God. And, you know, she might think, wow, that's me. 
and she got a little uppity. And she was really, she says she despised her mistress. Well, that's a mess. How's God's promise supposed to be bad for everyone? Now, Sarai's feeling bad. You can imagine Abram. He's probably the proud father. Yes, Lord, you're finally fulfilling my promise. He was all excited. You ever thought about all that? We do that all the time. We help God out. We nudge him. We mistake things, you know, whatever. But, you know, I'm sure he was like torn between his wife and the mother of his child-to-be. I mean, think about the anguish that caused. And so she comes to him because women don't have a lot of rights back in that day. She, Sarah comes to Abram and said, hey, this is horrible. My maid despises me. She could have been mocking her. She could have been bragging. But there's, there's problems in the camp. And she said, you know, what are you going to do about it? He's the head of the household. And he said, you know what? You just do handle her however you want. I'm not getting involved in that. Just do whatever you want. So Sarai's mean to her. She's really mean. So Hagar is just like, well, here she was excited, thought maybe she was part of a promise. And here's Sarai feeling like, man, Lord, This is horrible. So Hagar runs off. Here she's pregnant. She's in the desert with nothing but just heartache and probably a bad attitude. But she's just crying out. And God sees her and hears her. And it's because of that it says... He called from heaven and said, I hear your misery. You're going to have a son. And she even told him what to name him, Ishmael. That's pretty cool. And she said, so go, he told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Change your attitude and let me work. And so in Genesis 16, 13, she gave this name. To the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees me. And that's how we know about Jehovah Roy, the God who sees. So that's kind of neat. Well, Jehovah Jireh, where did that start off? You just fast forward a few chapters. Well, now... Sarai has become Sarah, Abram, Abraham, and they have the miracle child. They knew. And so God speaks. Can you imagine how excited? Wouldn't that be amazing? A hundred-year-old man. I mean, you've got a woman and a man, a man and a wife that cannot physically create a child, and there you have one. Can you imagine the joy and the excitement and just the amazement? Talk about awe and wonder that they felt. And then the Lord speaks to Abraham and said, I want you to take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him to me. Well, we read that as a story and we just think, yeah, he was just such a man of faith, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to tell you, think about that. For one thing, he didn't tell mama. That was, I'm just saying, that thing, thank you, Lord. You know, know, and he did take servants, and the kid was old enough to help because he carried the wood. And so they took out, and I bet... He didn't get a lot of sleep. I bet he didn't eat or sleep. I've been in so much anguish. I've just You can't eat. You can't sleep. You just, you know, you've been in that gut wrenching just place where you're like, I know him. I know he's good. 
I know he can do anything because he gave me this boy. And I will obey him. And, and he went forth. And then he left the servants even because that's going to be probably problematic. And the little boy says, Daddy, um, where's the sacrifice? He told him, well, the Lord will take care of that. So he gets to the place. He binds the child and raises the knife. And the Lord calls out to him, Abraham, Abraham, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God. You have not withheld from me your son, your only son. He, and Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket. And so in Genesis 22, 14, Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And so that's how we know Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And that is actually the first name of God that I had a lot of personal encounters with at 30. I ended up a single mom with two little children and too little money. <laughs> and I was just like, man, but I was learning. I was open by then. I was like, Lord, you know, maybe you do know how to do this. I'm not sure, but I really need to know. And I did have um, a pastor and his wife that just, Lord help him. When I went to see him, I said, I don't want to have anything to do with your church. I just want you to help me, you know. <laughs> I have a little church hurt there. And he goes, Okay. He said, I don't know if I can help you with your circumstances, but I can help you know the Lord. I can help you hear his voice. I said, me? He goes, oh, yeah. So the first thing I did is take him my bills and my budget. And I said, I don't know. I can't. I'm pretty good at budgeting, but I can't make this work. Can you? He had been an accounting and economics professor at a university, and so he was good. At, he looked through. He looked. He looked through and he said, I don't see anything you can cut. I said, well, I'm short $40 a month every month and I'm going to pay my tithe. He said, well, you just have to ask the Lord. He's a provider. And I said, I've heard that. I've heard that name. Well, the next day I had... Uh, a 19-month-old son, and I had bought him some Superman underwear the summer before, and he was not interested. And I just told him, well, that's fine. When you get to be big, well, you can wear those, and you don't have to wear your diapers. Enough said. Been months. Didn't worry about it. That night, I am bathed him. I'm getting him dressed, and he said, I'm not wear diaper. I wear pants. I'm like, yeah, that's nice. Get your diaper on. I wear pants, he said. And I was like, okay, that's great that you're suddenly interested. I didn't snap to anything. And he's, I said, but we don't start at night. Every mother knows you start in the day. You do not start at night. And so I told him, well, well, you can wear pants tomorrow. No, no, mommy. He said, I wear pants now. And so after like 20 minutes, I thought, Lee, what are you doing? This is every mother's dream. Just go with it, you know. <laughs> and so I said, okay. And I put on his big boy Superman pants. But I'll tell you, I didn't get a lick of sleep that night because I, I, you know, the bed, I was not prepared for this. I was shocked, you know, and I was just like, okay. So I was in there all night trying to make sure we didn't wet the bed. He wasn't crying for, you know, just everything. Oh. He made it. He never, I don't even understand that, never had an accident. And I realized at the end of the month 
that Jehovah Jireh really was my provider because my diaper bill was $40 a month. And I was like, it's real, you know? So I love that, you know? And, um, and then Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. In Exodus 15, so you'd had all these plagues and just miraculous things have happening. And suddenly these slaves that have been slaves for like 400 and some years are free. And they're leaving Egypt with, and, and loaded down with gold and all kinds of stuff and clothes and stuff. Well, they get to the Red Sea and then, you know, God parts the Red Sea and they go through. And then here comes the Pharaoh's, you know, army after them. And they're all nervous, but, it, you know, they get crashed and burned. And so everybody gets on the other side. They're singing the song of Moses and Miriam dancing and just having a great time And three days later, they're still walking through the desert, couldn't find any water. They finally find some, and it's bitter, and you cannot drink it. So a million people are coming to Moses saying, hey, what do we do now? Well, if that was you, it's like, God... (laughs) Why why are we doing this? So, of course, he seeks the Lord under pressure. I doubt he got a lot of sleep with those, with leading that many people. And, of course, the Lord just tells him, well, just pick up that wood and throw it in there. It'll be fine. So, what I mean, do you want to do that in front of everyone? But he did, and the water got sweet, and they drank it. And it was like, wow. But Moses had cried out. And so now the Lord comes and he initiates. Because before, the people that were touched named him. Now the Lord said, if you listen carefully to the Lord, this is Exodus 15, 26, your God, and do what is right in his eyes. If you pay attention to his commandments and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any, any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. And that's how we know Jehovah Rapha. And then there's Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. In Exodus 17, they've gone further And now the Amalekites are attacking them, this pagan culture. And it's like they're going to be wiped out pretty soon. It's long before they entered the promised land. They're just in the desert wandering around. Here come the Amalekites. And so Moses seeks the Lord, and he tells Joshua, get the men, slaves. These are untrained. They're not army. They're making bricks and in survival mode. Y'all go fight the enemy, he said. I will go with two friends up to the top of the mountain and, you know, raise my hands to the Lord. Would you go? Well, they did. They went with Joshua. But Moses, you know, as long as he had his hands up, Things are going well, and they're winning. But you get tired. I don't know how long it lasted, but I think a long time. So every time he'd have to drop his arms for a little while, they were getting crushed. So, you know, it's like, oh, my goodness. Sometimes you need some help. And I learned that early on. Sometimes it's okay to call someone and say, man, I'm not doing well. Pray for me. Help me. What do I do about this? I need you to listen. I need you to come. You know, I need a little comfort. Sometimes you need a quick, you know, kick, but whatever. They held his arms up. They got him a rock to sit on, held his arms up, and they won the battle. And really not many other people messed with him after that for a long time. And it says in 
Exodus 17, 15, Moses built an altar and he called it, the Lord is my banner. One time I was at a conference pretty early on and they sang this song, his banner over me is love. And I was singing it and it was a nice song. And all of a sudden I sang it and I realized I don't know, something hit me and I saw him and I realized his banner over me is love. That's a little overwhelming. No matter what's going on, he's got this and and he's love. He's patient when I'm going through stuff. And it became real to me just singing it. And then there's Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. You know who started that one? Gideon. (laughs) Remember in Judges, the angel of the Lord, which they say is actually, if you do any study, where the angel of the Lord comes and people bow down and they don't say get up. They say that's the pre-incarnate Christ. And I believe that's probably true. Because every angel encounter will say, don't bow down to me, you know. But anyway, the angel of the Lord, the Lord came to him and says, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Gideon said, well, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And I think we've all been there. I mean, they're having to hide and just, you know, grind grain in a wine press because the Midianites are coming down, taking all their food. They're starving to death. And so Gideon says, and where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But Midian said, but now God's forsaken us. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And Gideon said, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan's the weakest. I'm the least. And the Lord goes on, go, I'm going to be with you. And you're going to strike them down. So then Gideon says, well, let me go prepare a meal for you and see if you, okay, okay. So he gets a young goat and prepares that, remember that? And he makes some unleavened bread and he brings it out. And then the Lord tells him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over it. So he does that, probably thinks, hmm, why'd I bother to cook it if I'm going to just pour it on a rock? And then the Lord reached out the tip of his staff that was in his hand and he touched the meat and the bread and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed it and the Lord vanished. Well, then Gideon gets really terrified because he says, oh, I have seen the Lord face to face and he knows from his history that you don't live usually if you have that encounter. So he is absolutely terrified. But the Lord says to him, I guess he either came back or just spoke with his voice. Peace be to you. Do not fear. You will not die. And Gideon built an altar there and called it. The Lord is peace. And that's how we know about Jehovah Shalom. And then Jehovah Sabaoth, I don't know if I'm probably not saying it right, the Lord of hosts, that's David and Goliath. Remember that? And I think about that kid, and, you know, we just think he's just fearless, which he was, but I bet his adrenaline was pumping. If you you want to send your teenage son out to face a nine or ten foot tall guy that's been a warrior all his life, 
He even has an armor barrel. He's got two people. He's got all this stuff. And if you remember, Goliath threatened him. This is pretty stressful. I feed you to the birds, boy. And David said, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And we know how that turned out. So, the Lord of hosts. So, my first point, I have three tonight, is we don't have to be upset when circumstances or relationships or things are not working out. Instead, we need to ask a question. Who do you want to be for me, Lord? Who do you want to be for me? We're in good company with all these old saints and also with Jesus. You know, when he was in the garden, he was stressed. He sweat blood, but he's still he asked God, can't we do this another way? But he still yielded and he chose to trust his daddy. And he did it intentionally. He made an intentional choice to go to the cross and to rise again. And here we are. Well, after I learned and began to experience all the names of God, then I read John one time just over and over and over and over. And sometimes I do that because it's the most beautiful book to me. I love that. And I especially love the part in John 1, 14a, the first part, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And I began to see him differently because I thought, wow, the word became flesh. It became human. And so all those words that I just learned, shalom, Jehovah Roy, the God who sees this banner over me is love. All those things he provides, he heals our peace, our wholeness. And then starting with light be through every one of those words, that's who came here and became flesh. He's the perfect representation of the Father. He left heaven, came down here as a man, a real human being, so he could be seen and known and experienced with our five senses. And you think about it. You know, God's original intention, originally, he created humans and he put them in a garden. It was perfect. It was peaceful. There was life. There was harmony. There was no death. But when Jesus came, he came in the midst of chaos. He came to a country where his own people were occupied by a foreign dictatorship and a pagan culture. It was dominated by fear and control on both sides. And that's where he came for us. And he came to bring and restore that peaceful garden and place that his dad originally made for us. So he spent his life, he poured it out to 12 guys. And I always wondered, why did you waste your time on the one who would betray you? I understand maybe you put up with him. But even on the night he was betrayed, when he came, he calls him friend. So I was like, hmm. And we all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he came, you know, None should perish and be saved. But sometimes we forget about John 3, 17. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him could be saved. 
And I realized I'm supposed to be the gardener, not the sheriff. All those things he told us in the Beatitudes about loving your enemies and doing good to those who treat you wrong, he walked that out for us with Judith, Judas. He spent time with them. He died. He rose again. And then after he rose, he came back for 40 more days and he left telling them, it's to your advantage that I leave. He said, but wait for Holy Spirit to come. Because now, especially in the Old Testament, a lot of times I think we know God is Father. And now we've seen Jesus. And he's like, oh, you're going to be better off with this guy. Wait for Holy Spirit. And they did. And that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the actual spirit of God, the word became flesh and dwelled among us, now could dwell inside us. The word became flesh, and now he can dwell inside us. We can look like our father. Those 12 men after that experience in Acts 2 literally rocked the known world. Well, 11, but they added another one, you know. And their preaching of the gospel spread all over. And some 2,000 short years later, we heard about it. So that's pretty cool. We heard the gospel. We confessed with our mouth that Jesus that the Lord Jesus, Jesus is Lord, and we believed in our heart that God raised him from the dead, and we were saved, and our names were written in the Lamb's book of life. And that's a miracle that he did that. And now we're in the door. But we don't want to stay in the door. When you go see your friends and your family, they open the door to you, But then they invite you in. And I am learning that we have been invited to live in the living room and in all the rooms of the house. Because there is no limit to our relationship with the Lord. There are no limits. There's no limit to him being your healer. There's no limit to him being your provider. There's no limit to his banner over you as love. There's no limit to his power. There's no limit to his understanding. And there's no limit in your relationship with him. I have several friends that I've known all my life. And I love to get together with them. Especially one. Because... We have so much history. I don't have to explain. She knows my my mother, my dad. She knows how I grew up. She knew my brothers. She knew about the Bayou. She knows everything. We grew up together. We were roommates in college. So we get together and I love it. No boxes. You can talk about the Lord. You can talk about memories. It's just so much fun. We even went on a, a trip after college with a big group. And we spent six weeks running all over uh, Europe, mostly in Rome, and we went to Paris and Athens, just Switzerland. We just had a blast. Went to Greece. And so we have so many good memories. But you know, I have more memories now with him because he was there. Not only in your past, when you're growing up, he formed you. Before you were even in your mother's womb. He formed you and fashioned you. You were his poetry. You know, he's been there before you. And he will be there after you. And once you pass over, you'll be with him for eternity. Have you ever thought about that? So we get a lifetime here to make memories with him. I just think that's so cool. And when I worship, somebody asked me the other day, why do you laugh and cry? I said, I don't know. I said, I kind of do because I got this movie in my head going on. And I keep remembering time after time after time when he's met me in so many different ways. I just, 
I'm, I'm, I'm amazed by him. I've never met anyone as kind as the Lord. Never. And I've known some really kind people, and y'all are, are part of them. I mean, it's just amazing to me. So we start getting mature, and we learn that the word become flesh living on the inside of us can be expanded. God's kingdom begins to expand inside of us and begins to touch people outside of us. As we experience the instead of Isaiah 61, we begin to give him some of those ashes of regret and past and hurts and all this stuff. And we receive beauty. I imagine he just has beauty pageants in heaven from all the ashes. You men are part of it too. He gives us. We give him our mourning and our depression and our sadness. And he gives us the oil of joy that actually strengthens us just through his laughter. We give him our broken hearts. And I remember telling him one time, I don't even have a broken heart. I'm shattered pottery. I'll never be one again. And he said, you watch me. You watch me. Because he never stops. He never stops working in us. And it is his delight and his joy. He's so amazing. (laughs) we begin to experience freedom and release from captivity, from addictions. We get the garment of praise instead of that old heaviness and despair. And gradually, we begin to be transformed. He literally takes the parts of our lives that are on the garbage heap and he makes gold. I have to show you this little plate. I have it on my mantle because it reminds me all the time of what he does. We all have scars. And we try so hard. We're so ashamed of them sometimes to hide them. Jesus did not hide his scars. That was one way they recognized him when he rose again because of the scars. So if we give him our scars, all that stuff. He not only mends us, but he mends us with gold. And once restored, we are actually more valuable than the original. It's kind of cool. This costs more than if I would have just bought the original one before it broke. Isn't that something? And we begin to see what he is gold in us. I've begun to experience the gold that he's put in me. And then I'm looking, I'm thinking, there's gold in you. Bill Johnson said with tears, I saw this little short the other day. I would never, never tear down or criticize another believer because I would be tearing down the very image of Christ. We must see the gold in each other and see what the Lord has done and not bring up all that stuff. We walk with each other to this. So I love that. (laughs) Romans 6, 11 says, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin but alive to Christ. I found that I was spending a lot of my time working on my dead body. I hate to say it. Do we really want to carry cadavers around and put some makeup and try to fix them? And, oh, you know, you should have done better with that. Come on, you, you could do this. You can do this. You can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Come on, what's wrong with you? That's such foolishness. I think that I've begun to see lately that our concentration on is not on that, not on working on that. I don't think God works on that. We were buried with him in baptism. We, that guy is gone. 
And so what we work on is, Lord, how do I live alive to you in this circumstance? How do I live alive to you with this relationship? What are you doing? <clears throat> That's what I want to be like. I don't want to spin any more wheels. So transformation is getting easier. And you know, we're in good company. When Jesus was young, before he began his ministry, I don't know up to what age, it says he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And this transformation process, to me at first, was a lot of suffering. Because I was like, man, I just keep yielding, and it, it was painful. Sometimes it is painful. But by the time he went to the cross... Even though he suffered, he did that for the joy set before him. And I'm beginning to see the joy set before me. It's exciting to just, you know, to ask him, who do you want to be for me now? What are we going to do about this? How are we going to do this, Lord? Do you want me to pay for this? Do you, how do you want to do this? Let's make some more memories. In Romans 2, uh, 12, 2, you know, it says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then Titus 3, 5, he saved us not because of righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, therefore, we don't lose heart. But though our outer person is decaying, this mortal body, yet our inner person is being renewed day by day. Well, I looked up renew in all those places and some others, and it's so amazing. I mean, we all know make new again, restore. That's good. That's good. But listen to all, you know, the, the Greek and the Hebrew language is different than than you know, English. And so it's a lot more active and I don't know. Um, so let me just read you some of the words that describe this one. We just picked renew. It's repetition. We have to do it again and again. Intensity. It's action that describes a continuing renewal. It's not a one and done. We always want one and done and it's always a process. But it's intensity that grows. It's a reversal of something old into something that's new and unheard of. You're changed into a new kind of life. You grow up, it says. Grow up. Be renewed. You're growing up. We have new strength and vigor to make new again. We're renewed by a change of heart, a change of life. We're raised up. It says upward movement from a lower place so you have a higher perspective. And then listen to this, what word they described, renew, remodel. If any of you have done any remodeling, you start with a demo. Start with a demo. And then you clean that up <clears throat> and rebuild on firm foundation. We are being remodeled from above by cooperating. It's a complete change for the better. And that's what's happening to us. So we have a new kingdom and we are really under a new governmental authority. Some 4,000 years ago, it says from Adam to Jesus was around 4,000 years. And then, at least that's the best Google has. And then from Jesus to us is around 2,000 years. So, you know, we can blame them for not recognizing them, but we don't always. Because they had lots of time when they lived under a governmental regime, really the one of Satan. Because that's what happened in the garden. They literally changed the authority over them. They changed governments. It would be like you moving from America to a communist country. Now, I live here. It would be a culture shock for us to do that. 
And I thought, wow, Lord, I didn't realize that. I wonder if that was a purpose in me. I happened to read three books last year. Some were in a part of a, my book club. The Son of Hamas, which is a true story about Masab Yusuf. He grew up. His father was one of the big people, big heads of Hamas. He grew up, grew up in the Gaza Strip, controlled by Hamas, grew up Muslim. Um, they were imprisoned a number of times, he and his father, and he hated Israel and the West. His, everything in him. We were just infidels, and their only desire was to kill, kill us, kill them. And something happened, and the IDF came to him and convinced him to spy for them. Well, he went for it because he told some, one of his friends, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to infiltrate the IDF, and then I'm going to kill them all. But what happened to him is he started working for them, and one thing they did was send him to university and pay for it. They provided him food and shelter, and he was like, that, the, nothing I was taught is, this is not real. He realized that all of his ideology was based on a lie, and it really shook him to the core. Eventually, he actually became a Christian by a job that the IDF got him, and he just hung out with some Americans and different cultures, and they were Christians. And then he ended up coming here. And it was just, um, can you imagine the culture shock that would be for you? And then I read Joy, God's Secret Weapon for Every Believer, Believer by Georgian Banoff. It was his life story. He grew up in communist Bulgaria. Now, the son of Hamas was Muslim. This guy was an atheist. He was in Bulgaria. It was run by communists. He got in a rock band and was quite a rebel. They used to play at underground clubs when he was a teenager. And they, somehow he knew he had to get out of there because he was going to end up in prison because he was just too rebellious. And so he, they, he and his buddies in the band ended up somehow getting permission to go to, to Berlin, to Germany, and to play in East Berlin. And he said he climbed up in some building and looked down, and he was so amazed because in East Berlin, when he looked down, it was just gray and colorless and not much movement. And when he looked into West Berlin, there were color, even the clothing. He said it was just so, and just a whirlwind of activity. And he was just like, I got to go there. I got to get there. So they ended up make, being smuggled across, and they made it. And then he, you know, he ended up going, getting to America and going to Hollywood because, you know, he's going to be, he's going to do his rock band thing. But he doesn't know the language. He doesn't have any food, any money. I mean, he just, it was a crazy story. It's a wonderful story. This man is just a leading evangelist. He and his wife have spent their lives. When that wall came down, they went back to communist Bulgaria and really won millions in the nation for the Lord. They have established all kinds. They work with Heidi Baker and they've established all kinds of orphanages all over the world. And he's just so full of joy. But he said he could not grasp freedom or Christianity. And he ends up in California and being taken in by a bunch of hippies that that were part of the Jesus movement. Well, they just fed him. He said, well, I don't want any of this. Y'all crazy, you know. But they, he said, I'll take the food. And they said, that's fine. You just come and we'll feed you. So he just started hanging out with them, eating practical needs, gave him a place to stay, fed him. And then he just said, 
they were just so peaceful and he was so chaotic inside. And finally, he just said, man, I need whatever this is, you know, and it changed him. But, and then I, the last book I read was Yan Mi Park. I don't know if you've read that. She escaped from North Korea. It's also a true story. She had no religion because Kim Jong-un was God. They were taught that, ev- that the, the head, you know, could even read their thoughts. So they better not even think anything that was counter to the leader. And those people, I mean, she looked around. They were just starving to death. You had the haves and then power and you had to have knots. And so she finally ended up as kind of part of the sex trafficking trade, if you read the book, but she got out of North Korea and eventually came to the United States kicking and screaming because she'd been taught that the West was her worst enemy. And again, she found out that wasn't true. Guys, I think that we're in a little bit of culture shock that we don't always realize that we are in a new kingdom. And guess what? It's not democracy. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. We don't think a lot of times like a kingdom person. A kingdom is... The king's word is the law. You don't have rights, except he gave us the right to become children of God because of his sacrifice. So we have to think differently. And when you're young, of course, I'm seeped in democracy. So I think, whoo, that sounds horrible. That's no fun. But what you learn as you get older is that's actually the most fun, the most adventurous. You'll never be so excited, so happy, so full of life. There's nothing like walking in the kingdom. I am still convinced that the Lord is going to let me walk on water before I leave this side because I just think it'd be fun. Yeah. He said we can do greater, so maybe I could jet ski without the jet ski. I'm not sure, but um, I'd settle for starting off walking on water. So I'm going to do three scriptures, and I'm going to end with this. Mark 1.10, this is so fun to me. It's just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven, remember that, being torn open when he was baptized? Heaven tore open, the Spirit descended on him. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Spirit remained. And what I'd like to talk about is that when he did that and it opened up, he he restored identity, our identity and our connection with heaven. Because remember in the garden, there was an open heaven. God came down. He talked to them. There was nothing off limits to them. And they, they, did, they had unbroken fellowship. And then here's Jesus, and he restores that as our identity with our Papa. Unbroken fellowship and relationship. And then, so I looked, and then in Matthew 27, 51... Remember after he said he's on the cross, he says, it is finished. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks split. Jesus died then. He's already restored our identity, and then he dies and rips that veil apart and so that we can come in boldly. If we accept him, he gave us the right, one of our, I think our only rights, I don't know, to become children of God, and we can go to him anytime. 
which is just, I think that's amazing. And then in Luke 5, 36 and 37, Jesus told him a parable. So we've talked about the heaven is ripped open, you know, and then the Lord came down on him as a dove and stayed, remained on him. And then when he died, the curtains ripped open, the rocks split open, tore open. And now we go to Luke 5, 36 and 37. He told the parable, no one tears or rips a piece, same word, piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they're going to have torn the new garment and the patch won't hold and it won't match. It won't match the old. And no one, the next verse, pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst or rip open the skins and the wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. All of these words are the same, rip open. And the thing is, if we are not, if we don't let the Lord transform our thinking, we need a new mind for new wine. Because otherwise, we can't hold on to it. We get revelation and it just like Eddie, I thought he was going to preach the sermon. It falls on the ground and we can't hold on to it. We have to get a new mind. We have to. We have to be renewed. Or we can't hold it. But we can be renewed. It is it is up to us to surrender and to yield our attitudes, our thoughts, our beliefs, and our actions. It's up to him to change us. But we have a choice every time. And I think we forget that part. Well, Lord, you said, I tell you, I'm here surrendering. I'm surrendering during worship. So go ahead and transform me. I'm having trouble in this area and I need you to work on it. I need you to work on it now. Well, what's our practice? Because you know, Graham Cook says practice makes permanent. Permanent. And it's, guys, we are practicing. We are practicing. And the way we do that, we practice, is one thought at a time, one word at a time, and one action at a time. We need to learn to think like a saved per person. We have access to every word in the book. And so if a thought comes, we run it through. Does that thought, we test it, we test it. Does that thought say that he's my healer? That he's my provider. That I don't have to have any anxiety. Because he hadn't given me a spirit of fear. But a power, love, and a sound mind. What does that thought say? Does it say I'm loved with an everlasting love? Does it say he comforts me like a mother comforts her child? Does, he, does that thought say my tears are so precious to him that he collects and records every single one of them? Because that's what the word said. And the word made flesh lives in us. And we can test every thought that comes and say, I'm not thinking that I'm going to have another thought and it's going to line up with the living word that's inside of me and I have access to 24 7 that's all I'm saying if we have a word that comes out of our mouth does we give it the test does it line up with him as the word and if it doesn't oops sorry about that Lord, forgive me. I'm going to practice again. I'm going to have another word. I'm going to have another thought. 
We have the power to choose, and he will strengthen us as we choose. He will begin to make it easier and easier. And I have to tell you that this transformation process has made me so in love with him. I've never, never, never had anybody as kind to me as he is. It's just absolutely astonishing. I even wrote a list of adjectives so I could praise him more. I just did it in ABC order. You're amazing. You're astonishing. You're astounding. You're bold. You're beautiful. You're compassionate. You're caring. You're delightful. You're infinite. You're holy. You're, it just goes on and on. He's joyful. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he loves me. Amen. He's captured my heart, you know. He's tremendous. He's resplendent in light. There's just, I have to have more words for my worship because I had a small worship vocabulary, and I'm tired of overusing it. <laughs> of course I'm going to get that he's worthy in there and holy, I, you know, but I need to expand his kingdom inside of me. I want to put more words in there so that when hard times come, when I was at, you know, I went through a betrayal in the last few years and all I could think of was on the night he was betrayed. I remembered that word on the night he was betrayed. He didn't say, I've had enough. I don't know why I poured into you. Why did you do that? He didn't. He went to his father. Yes, he, you know, he ended up sweating drops of blood. I didn't do that, but I had some broken blood vessels from crying. But I poured it out because I thought on the night he was betrayed. He wraps a towel around him and he bends down and he washes the feet of his betrayer. I said, Lord, please don't hold anything against him on my account. I want to be like you because that way is the way to life. There is nothing, nothing worth hanging on to for that old garbage because this is what you can do with that place in me. I'm going to have gold replace it because that's what you paid for. And we can all have that one thought at a time, one word at a time. There is no limit. <sighs> the Lord of hosts is on our side and he's for us and he sees us. And he carries us when we can't go like a father carries his winged son. He's always present. He always hears. He's always available. And he delights in our desire for relationship with him. And if we do it wrong, he's like, that's okay. Come on. Try again. You can do it because I'm for you. And the last thing, I guess I'll read you this. The word I found, I had no idea the depth. I've studied it off and on all my life. And I spent two weeks in Psalm, 120, Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And I have to tell you, the Lord, the Lord, the word for Lord there is the one that Moses met in the burning bush. The I am, the all existent one, the one that is for us. He is for us, whatever we need. The word for shepherd is the one who watches over me. 24 7 he tends to me he is attentive to every need i have i shall not want listen to the hebrew words we chose want listen to what it says in hebrew 
I shall not lack. I won't decrease. I won't be in failure or left in bereavement. I won't be orphaned or abandoned or left. I won't be robbed or stripped. I will not be made lower or diminished or deprived. I will not stay sorrowful or widowed. And I was like, really, Lord? Some people are widowed. You're going to have to explain that one. He did. I will not be threatened or reduced or made less. I will have the instead. Because the Lord is my shepherd and he watches over me and tends to me at all times. And this is for every one of us. We will walk in abundance and increase. We will walk in victory and success. We will be joyful and cheerful. We have been adopted into God's family. We've been embraced and cherished and cared for. Your family didn't work out. That's okay. You have another one and it's forever. And if you let him do all he can do in you, you can be part of the restoration for the rest of the family. Somebody has to. You can stand for him. Whether you see it in this lifetime or not, wouldn't you like to go out in faith and be in Hebrews 11? Bob stood for. Kai stood for. We all stood for this person in faith, believing the promises that God had given us. Because that's powerful and it changes things. We will prosper. In every area, we will be covered and clothed. We will be raised up, burned brightly for him. We will arise and shine everywhere we go. We will be restored and enriched. We will be satisfied and content. We will be the bride. We are the bride of Christ. We are protected and we are safe. And that's what we have instead of wanting. That's a lot. I finally stopped after two weeks. I thought, well, I'll dive in again later. But we will increase, be enlarged and expanded. We'll emerge in our true identity as sons. And daughters, precious children of the Most High. We're going to walk in the more. We're going to experience his kingdom come in, in us and through us. And everywhere we go and be able to give that away. Thank you. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for who you're going to be. And who you've already been for us. You never give up. You never give out. You never give up hope on us. You're always hopeful. <laughs> You're always happy to see us. And when we mess up, we just run to you and we're safe. Thank you. We ask you to touch us and help us to get everything you paid for. That we leave the earth with an expansion of your kingdom and a legacy of faith. In Jesus' name, amen.